Coming up on Jerusalem Dateline, progress as the IDF destroys major amounts of Hamas tunnels and crushes its very best brigade. And Operation Summer Camp, IDF raids and operations in the growing hotbed of terror activity in Judea and Samaria. Plus, preserving Jewish history in Poland, teaching future generations about once vibrant Jewish communities and their destruction. All this and more coming up on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Julie Stahl. This was a big week in Israel, which included the dramatic rescue of a hostage from Gaza. A 52-year-old Bedouin Muslim man came out alive and was reunited with his family. The IDF also launched a major operation in the West Bank, otherwise known as Biblical Judea and Samaria. Chuck Holton has the story. The Israeli Defense Forces released footage of a military helicopter landing in Gaza, showing the daring rescue of 52-year-old Kaid Farhan al Qadi. He's the latest of eight hostages rescued alive since October 7th, and the first to be found in Hamas' vast network of underground tunnels. He's also a member of the country's Bedouin Arab minority, though he says he was given no special treatment as a Muslim. Israeli commandos rescued Kaid Farhan al Qadi from an underground tunnel following accurate intelligence. Al Qadi's brother told reporters the family is thankful for the world's prayers. Thank God. Thank God that gave us news today after 11 months, news that we didn't imagine and didn't dream of. And thanks to the people who prayed for us, to the whole world, all the good people in the world. The father of 11 also rejoiced at being reunited with his family. Did he meet his youngest son? Yes. What did he say? Excitement. He left him when he was four months old. Meanwhile, the IDF has launched its largest counterterrorism operation in the West Bank in more than 20 years, dubbed Operation Summer Camp. Palestinian sources report at least 10 Palestinians killed so far, including four in an airstrike on the volatile city of Jenin, which has been sealed off by Israeli forces. In Israel, al Qadi's rescue has renewed hope for the families of the remaining hostages. While some 108 hostages are still held in Gaza, about one-third are believed to be dead. Ceasefire negotiations are set to continue in Doha, Qatar, but Hamas is still not at the table. Uh, talks are moving forward today in Doha. Uh, President Biden directed Director Burns and Brett McGurk to participate for the United States. They're on the ground right now working with representatives from Israel, Qatar, uh, and Egypt. Qatar and Egypt are in turn mediating with Hamas. The resumption of these talks is an important step. And in the lead up to this meeting, we'd already narrowed some gaps. After 326 days in captivity, al Qadi appeared thin but healthy, giving his rescuers a thumbs up. Later, from a hospital bed in Beersheba, he spoke on the phone with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. There are still 108 hostages whose families are still waiting to hear news that their loved ones are home. And they should know that we will not rest. We will not rest until we fulfill our mission to bring all our hostages back home. From Jerusalem, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. The UN Security Council just renewed its peacekeeping mission in southern Lebanon. Its members failed to condemn Hezbollah or even to mention the Iranian-backed terror group. Meanwhile, the IDF destroyed a terrorist command center inside a West Bank mosque. They found explosives and weapons, along with a display honoring those terrorists who've attacked Israel. Take a look. The Israel Defense Forces say they found and destroyed a terrorist command center inside a mosque in the West Bank. IDF drone footage shows displays honoring dead terrorists and equipment to make bombs as well as several explosive devices. This, as top Hamas official Khaled Mashal, is calling for suicide attacks against Israelis. At the United Nations Security Council Wednesday, members renewed the mandate to maintain peacekeepers in southern Lebanon, but failing to specifically mention Hezbollah or condemn the terror group. Despite the UN mission, the peacekeepers have not taken action to stop Hezbollah from launching some 8,000 missiles and drones into Israel the last 10 months. We call on this council to finally enforce Resolution 1701 in full 
and to recognize Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. The U.S. representative at the U.N. said none of the nations present would put up with what Israel has had to endure. No member of this council facing a brutal terrorist organization on its border would tolerate daily attacks and displacement of tens of thousands of its own people. Since the U.N. forces are not stopping Hezbollah, Israel warned Lebanon that it must do the job itself. I have a message for the Lebanese people. You and your government have a choice to make. Confront Hezbollah today or watch as your country is dragged into chaos and destruction. More than 60,000 Israelis are displaced from their homes in the north, forced to flee Hezbollah's almost daily attacks. When will it be the end of the story? Only when we can bring back security and the residents to their homes safely. Meanwhile, in Gaza, Israel says it recovered the body of a soldier killed on October 7th and held by Hamas. Some 300 vehicles with families and friends of hostages drove from Tel Aviv to Kibbutz Be'eri, one of the hardest hit communities on October 7th. Some ran past the security fence to get closer to Gaza, and others called out to their loved ones in captivity. I need you to know that I am giving you now the blessing I give you every single morning when I pray for you and every Friday night. May God bless you and keep you. May God shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. As Israel's achievements in Gaza expand, Hamas has agreed to pause the fighting so hundreds of thousands of Gazans can be vaccinated against polio. At the same time, Israel says the war in the north must be expanded to restore security to the citizens there. Middle East correspondent Paul Strand has that story. The Israeli military says it has destroyed some 80 percent of Hamas's tunnels that could be used to smuggle weapons into Gaza from Egypt. It also says IDF fighters have basically finished off Hamas's Rafa brigade, believed to be one of Hamas's biggest and best group of fighters. The IDF's military achievements in Gaza have enabled the return of most of the southern communities to their homes. The military achievements have also created the conditions that enabled the return of a large number of hostages and created the conditions required to return a large number of the remaining hostages. And with the threat of a polio outbreak erupting, both the IDF and Hamas have agreed to three-day humanitarian pauses in fighting to allow 640,000 children under age 10 in Gaza to be vaccinated beginning Sunday. This agreement is a testament to our collective commitment to overcome barriers and protect every child from polio. Abdel Rahman Abu El Jadan is the first child in Gaza in 25 years to contract polio. He was just a month old when the war in Gaza started, and his family had to flee from camp to camp. My son was not vaccinated because of the continued displacement, and we are sheltering here in the tent in such health conditions where there is no medication, no capabilities, no supplements. And Israel's Defense Minister Yoav Gallant says the goals of the present war must be expanded beyond the battles in Gaza to also deal with what's needed in Israel's north. More than 60,000 Israelis there have been forced to leave their homes by near daily rocket and drone attacks by Hezbollah. Our mission on the northern front is clear, to ensure the safe return of northern communities to their homes. In order to achieve this goal, we must expand the goals of the war and include the safe return of Israel's northern residents to their homes. Gallant says expanding the war up north will not diminish Israel's commitment to dismantling Hamas and getting all the hostages back. Paul Strand, CBN News, Jerusalem. This week, Israeli forces launched their largest operation in the West Bank in over two decades, targeting terrorist threats in multiple Sumerian cities. Correspondent Chuck Holton reports on the ongoing security challenges in this contested region. A large force of IDF has moved into several Sumerian cities, bringing in tanks and hundreds of troops. They've engaged Hamas fighters, discovered weapons and explosives. There's been constant operations really since October 7th and even before uh, in the West Bank, which is known in Israel as uh, Judea and Samaria, particularly in the northern Sumerian areas of Tokarim and Janine and, and also the uh, Palestinian town of Farah. I'm standing on Mount Gerizim, which is situated in Samaria, what much of the world calls the West Bank. This city below me was once the biblical city of Shechem. Now it's known as Nablus. This region right over here 
is the Balata refugee camp. It is very well known and notorious as the birthplace of the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade and other terrorist organizations. And that's why this region is a huge hotbed for terrorist activity, especially these days. And that's one of the reasons why the IDF is performing these raids and operations into the West Bank areas, because what they're finding down here is the same thing that they found in Gaza. And that is that UNRWA, through their schools that they run out here, has been assisting these terror organizations in recruiting and training and indoctrinating young Palestinians to perform terror acts. The reason why we haven't seen all out war uh, between uh, forces in, in Judea and Samaria and Israel is because Israel has been going in with significant intelligence and, and hyper-focusing military activities on specific uh, terror uh, groups, small groups as they arise. As the main thing we have to understand, it's not our war, it's a common war because terror from here can raise all over the world. For Israelis in Judea and Samaria, the threat of terrorism is a daily reality. Many feel they could be targeted at any moment. There are a lot of the Arabs slash Palestinians living in our region, and we've been living kind of side by side, and sometimes they mind their own business, and many times they try and kill us. Ever since October 7th, it's gotten worse. This town I'm driving through is an Arab Muslim town in Samaria called Hawara, and it's been the site of a lot of unrest since October 7th. As a matter of fact, you can still see the remnants of burned tires in the street and things like that. And it's gotten to the point where it's so dangerous for Israelis to drive through here because their cars have a different color license plate than the cars from the Palestinian Authority, that they've started to take a longer route to go around and bypass this town when they have to come through this area. United States of America must stand strong with the people in Israel in this operation by attack the terror and not waiting for the terror to attack us. We have to clean this terror. Everyone that wants to live and stay here in peaceful, welcome. Israeli authorities are particularly concerned about UNRWA schools potentially fostering extremism here. There's growing evidence these UN-run institutions have educated and recruited young Palestinians to join in terrorist activities. I never seen school books in different uh, states that educate how you prepare and build a bomb. We must solve that. You cannot educate to kill us and think that we will let you live here beside us. It's very, it's too much risky. As tensions continue to simmer in the West Bank, Israelis are taking extra precautions to protect their families. There's a lot more security. There are more security cameras. We've been purchasing drones, thermal drones, and, and they've really been a lot of help. More guns, uh, everybody, you know, more guns in every community, and hoping and praying. Um, I spend my time praying. From Samaria, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. As anti-Semitism soars in Europe, some countries directly involved in the Holocaust are trying to maintain the memory of Jewish communities destroyed in the 1930s and 40s. Half of the six million Jews murdered lived in Poland, which ironically had invited Jews to live and flourish there. Here's a look at two cities working to restore that history. Northeastern Poland's largest city is Bialystok, with a population of 300,000. Jewish people first came here in the early 1600s. Those days, there were no trade, no small business uh, without Jewish community. So the owners of the little towns, they were inviting this kind of community because they needed them and they also paid taxes. So when they came here, they started to buy and sell things and they also ran breweries and shops. According to Anna Kroshnitska, a history teacher and tour guide in Bialystok, about 50,000 Jewish people lived here leading up to World War II. So when Nazis came here, they knew that this is a very important Jewish city. At the very, very beginning, I mean 27th of June, 1941. Behind me is a memorial to the Great Synagogue in Bialystok. In 1941, the Nazis marched in and burned it to the ground with 800 people inside. The same day, they killed 1,200 more on the streets. 
and it was just the beginning. Then they gathered the whole Jewish community in the ghetto. Uh, they were using them as slaves. They were working, hard working. It was uh, the time that those people were starving there. Um, but still, they had a hope to survive. Despite an uprising two years later, Nazis took almost the entire community to Treblinka and murdered them there. After the war, about 300 Jews returned to Bialystok and tried to live here. What happened in Poland in 1968, communists said that all the Jewish people should go to Israel. So they, the, the last 120 people, something like this, just left Bialystok. Today, about 20 Jews live in Bialystok, with none having Jewish family roots in the city. There is a redemptive move, however. Anna says people in her town want to make sure the Jewish history is not forgotten. We have a special tray. We are not anti-Semites. We really want to show that we remember and the Jewish part of the history of Białystok is as important as other parts. Nearly 200 miles away in Lublin, the Jewish community started at about the same time in the 16th century. Uh, when Jewish people came here, uh, mostly as a refugees from Western and uh, Eastern Europe, they settled surrounding the, uh, around the castle, King's Castle of Lublin, and, well, they lived there peacefully for hundreds of years. Historian and tour guide Zemovit Karlovich tells CBN News many prominent rabbis came from this vibrantly rich society. The Jewish community of Lublin, just before the Second World War, it was like 43,000, one third of the population of our town. And this again was very, let's say, diverse community. There were many political parties, there were many uh, views on the life and on the religion and, uh, and on politics. When the Germans arrived though, they turned the Jewish district into a ghetto. They surrounded it by barbed wire. And Jewish people that were trapped inside there, they were thinking that they can survive the war. Nothing bad can happen to them. Well, after war, it all finished. But this never come, this end of war, at least for them. The building on my right was a Jewish orphanage and elderly home. When the Nazis exterminated the Lublin ghetto in 1942, they murdered the 200 children, the elderly, and the child caregivers who refused to abandon the children. The SS forces came and they started to throw away people from their houses, driving them to a square near the synagogue. And Jewish people were not resisting because, well, that never happened before. This was the very first ghetto in the world that was destroyed during Aktion Heinhardt or, or the Holocaust, the German code name for them. Almost all Lublin's Jews died in the Belgic concentration camp. We know about 1,000 survived of them. But right now, Jewish community of Lublin is like 50, 70 people, and none of them is speaking Yiddish, the language that was so prominent in Jewish district before the war. Now the Polish people in Lublin are telling many of those stories to the international community through the Gorczka Gate Theater Cultural Institution. My grandfather once said that if we will let the memory of these people die, it will be like the Nazis have won. No. We cannot do this. I'm a historian. My job is to remember things and remember people. And you see, this is the history of our town. Lublin doesn't really exist without the memory of the Jewish people who are here. This is part of our history. We cannot forget it. Growing up under communist rule, Karlovich says he didn't learn about the Jewish history until high school. Now he and others hope to change that, including the Jewish story as part of Lublin's history that's taught in elementary school. Our friend and Israeli tour guide Hannah Ben Haim has lived in Israel for 40 years and always has an interesting take on the latest happenings in the country. Here's a conversation she had with our bureau chief, Chris Mitchell, on the 10-month anniversary of October 7th. Hannah Benheim, great to be with you again. We talked after the beginning of the war, after October 7th, about we did. what Israel was going through. Here we are 10 months later after October 7th. What's happening to the nation right now? Yeah, exactly 10 months. Well, to say we're weary, it's been a long 10 months. We've been under tremendous stress. We've paid an enormous price in lives. In uh, You think of how many people have been displaced in these months, how many people have been traumatized at this time, 
how many people have been injured, thousands injured, how many we've lost. I mean, the price is huge and we're tired, but there's no way to give up. There's no way that the battle is over. And so I think people are just sort of living on grit right now. Mm. And um, that grit is gonna, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, if, unless you have the Lord and you're renewed by that, that grit is a hard way to live. Yeah. So the stress of everything coming down upon us and looking worse as we get farther into these battles has taken a huge toll on the emotions and the strength of the people. Yeah, like a lot of Israeli moms, uh, you have three children in the... Well, two grandchildren and a child. Right, okay. Um, what's that like? Well, <laughs> do you have a choice? You know, you don't have a choice. I have come to a place of real surrender. And I think many mothers and grandmothers, and I know people who are in much more, you know, severe situations where, I mean, we just have to trust God. You know, you can't worry all day. We do pray a lot. I can say that I pray a lot. And I pray not just for my own children and grandchildren, but I pray for all of those who are in the battle because they're in the battle for you and me. The reason I'm sitting here right now and able to enjoy the beauty of Jerusalem is because we have our children and our grandchildren on the front line fighting for us. So it's part of our lives. This is not a new occurrence. Living in Israel 40 years, I mean, I've lived through many battles, many uprisings, wars, and um, if it wasn't my husband, it was my children, and now it's my grandchildren. Yeah. A lot of people, a lot of questions we have asked over the months has been that is Israel facing the battle that the whole world is facing? In what way do you think that people need to understand that this is not just a battle of Israel, this is a battle for the rest of the world? This is a battle between darkness and light. We are not angelic people. We are not beyond fault. As a matter of fact, we have every sin that every other nation has. But God has put us in a place like the little boy holding his thumb in the dike. And if we don't win this victoriously, and if the terrorists who have organized themselves in such strength against Israel right now, if they aren't defeated, the tsunami that will come out of this, that will attack every nation, will be horrendous. There will be no grace left. And there is a time of grace and salvation that is still on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. So yes, we are fighting for the whole world. Mm. So what's your message to people that are listening to this, perhaps in America or other places? Stand with us. Whatever it takes for you to be a voice, whatever it takes for you, whether it's in your prayer closet or whether it's on the streets or whether it's writing or whether it's speaking to your officials. I mean, everyone has a part in this. We are fighting for our lives against a force that wants us dead. And that, of course, is darkness and satanic. So anyone who wants to live better be standing with Israel. That's what I would say to them. You don't have a choice. You can't be blasé anymore. And it's going to cost you. So get ready to pay the price. Well, sober but great message, uh, Hannah bin Hein. Thank you. That's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on social media and access CBN content through our CBN apps. And please, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, for IDF soldiers and all those caught in harm's way, and for the return of all the hostages. And remember, the God who watches over Israel and you and me neither slumbers nor sleeps. I'm Julie Stahl. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.